happening tonight in Vancouver. You have uh, uh, lightning strikes uh, and fires developing near communities uh, that may well uh, result in, in significant evacuations. Increasing wildfires and weather warnings has BC under a state of emergency again. We just watched it grow and grow and grow at a rapid pace. An out of control wildfire continues to burn just outside of Asuyas. Just ahead, the flames that have forced evacuations around the popular BC wine country destination. If 800 puppies died during that four day period, we would have done something the next day. The Vancouver Park Board has passed a motion to try and help seniors in the event of another deadly heat wave. Will it actually make a difference? This is City News Everywhere. Nearly three weeks after wildfire destroyed the community of Lytton, some people living nearby will finally be allowed to head home. The evacuation order has been downgraded to an alert for more than 50 properties across the Thompson River from Lytton. But the village itself, as well as the south side of the Thompson River, are still under an evacuation order. Two people died in the fire, which is still described as out of control. A change in weather leading to a change in BC's approach to wildfires. I am declaring a provincial state of emergency. The most recent status update from fire officials detailing danger increasing. A new weather system bringing wind warnings but no rain to areas already ablaze in the interior and the southeast, including Oliver and Asoyuz. If you have uh, uh, lightning strikes uh, and fires developing near communities, uh, that may well uh, result in, in significant evacuations. We've seen it in the past and we want to make sure that we are prepared for it. He says the state of emergency won't alter firefighting resources, but gives more power to support evacuees. With some of the 13 evacuation centers in place already at capacity, people in danger zones asked to arrange to stay with family and friends if possible. Make sure you have a plan and a bag packed so if you get the call or knock at the door, you're ready to leave. Create an emergency kit and then grab and go bag uh, for yourself or your family. Make sure that you have clothing, medications, water, food, comfort items, and important documents and things like photo albums, photo albums or other things that can't be replaced. And don't hesitate when ordered out. Smoke and flames don't wait, they say, nor should you. BC Liberal leader Shirley Bond, who's been calling on the province to make this move for weeks, is wondering why the province hesitated. Why the Premier stubbornly refused uh, to do what he knew eventually would have to happen. But I think uh, my, my first reaction is one, a huge sense of relief that every single resource that can be brought to bear will be. The resources now include more than 3,000 personnel fighting the fires, 100 more arriving from Mexico this weekend. All of this another devastating blow for communities and their tourism operators just out of the pandemic frying pan, now into the fires. Public safety uh, uh, is absolutely uh, paramount. Uh, and whether you're a resident or, or a tourist, uh, you expect that. And you need to expect the unexpected. People need to, to pay attention because, as we know, this is a fluid situation. So far, 300,000 hectares in B.C. have burned. That's 200,000 more hectares than the average at this point in the year for the past 10 years. For City News in Victoria, I'm News 1130's Lisa Yuzda. If 800 puppies died during that four-day period, we would have done something the next day. On Monday, the Vancouver Park Board passed a motion to help seniors and other vulnerable people in the event of a heat wave. This comes after more than 800 sudden deaths in a span of a week. They coincided with last month's sweltering temperatures. This is hopefully what's going to start all that discussion. And uh, yes, everyone's talking about it, but we need to have people, you know, officially start the process. And so that started last night with the park board. I know that the city is now starting. At this stage, Barker says there haven't been official talks between the park board and the city of Vancouver. Barker says something must happen now. I work with seniors every day. It is my day job. And I get a lot of feedback on what is happening with seniors. So when this happened with the heat dome, 
uh, I spoke to John Cooper about it right away, and I said, I'd like to bring this forward. He said, yes, let's do it. And so he helped me write this motion. Someone had to start the ball rolling. Barker agrees immediate action has to be taken, but she doesn't know how long it will take to put a plan in place. She does have some ideas when it comes to what should be included. The phone calls, the landlines, and sending out flyers to buildings to say, if you want us to help, you know, please contact us. You know, we still have the mail. We could do a mail out to people in all different languages. We do that for, you know, voter registry. We need to have a plan that physically goes to some people that we can't rely on necessarily talking to people on the phone. They think they're fine, so we think they're fine. And I think we, we have found that that is not always the case. BC Seniors Advocate says action can't come soon enough, but some challenges are still outstanding. For instance, what if people refuse help? We have to remember and respect that. The challenge will be for some seniors during the heat wave is that where they normally have uh, capacity and capability to make those kinds of, si of decisions, they're experiencing what we might call altered mental status. Language and technology barriers are also tough, but so is mobility. How do they physically get to the cool center. We need to remember that a lot of seniors are going to have mobility challenges in the best of time and those may be exacerbated as they're experiencing the, the impact of these high temperatures. For the City of Vancouver's part, it will take speakers regarding its motion on heat-related safety at another meeting Wednesday. In Vancouver, Rhea Renouf, City News. We just watched it grow and grow and grow at a rapid pace. Um, it was so incredible to watch and just to see how quickly it spread. A 2,000 hectare wildfire is burning out of control just outside of Asuyas, B.C. The fire started on Monday afternoon and has forced some people and at least one winery to evacuate. We had our entire family. There's uh, three sets of us that were up in a Soyuz camping and unfortunately it was cut short. Kayla Bordignon and her family were on the east side of Asuyas Lake at an RV camp for their annual camping trip when they made the call to leave. We evacuated at 2.30 in the morning um, ahead of the mandatory evacuation. Uh, we were in our trailer and it was shaking from the wind and I looked at my husband and I said, let's go. It's not worth risking. Gary Dell lives on the south end of Asuyas Lake and has lived in the area for about 70 years. He's been watching the flames grow up the hillside on the east side of the lake. The fire is half halfway up the little mountain that's there and I assume burning maybe more to the top. You know, years ago people didn't Maybe tended to live a little more in the town and weren't out in some of those rural areas. So, uh, you know, it wasn't so wasn't so rough on on residences and people and animals, I guess. On the north end of the lake in Oliver, there are a number of wineries on Black Sage Road. Guests at one winery estate were forced by search and rescue to evacuate overnight. So we started knocking on doors and waking up guests and asking everybody to pack up and um, vacated the property. So. I guess everybody was out by about one o'clock in the morning. From what we can tell, the winery is not really in imminent danger. And really the fire is uh, in the mountain in the valley behind us, so not really encroaching upon us. Kerry Wise McNulty believes the neighboring wine estates are in a similar situation. I would say that they're probably facing the same thing, kind of just waiting at this point to see what happens with the weather and with the firefighting efforts that are underway. Crews are battling the flames from the ground and the air, with air tankers dropping fire retardants on the west flank of the flames closest to homes. The Asuyas Indian Band has evacuated a number of properties, and an evacuation alert remains in effect for the whole town of Oliver. The cause of this wildfire is still under investigation. In Vancouver, Kirjunos, City News. BC is reporting 76 new cases of COVID-19, and there have been no new deaths in the last day. 54.4% of eligible British Columbians ages 12 and up have now been fully vaccinated. We've now reached 80% of that same group with a first dose of vaccine. 50 people are in hospital with the virus right now. 12 are in ICU. Opening ceremonies for the Tokyo Olympics are just three days away, but organizers say the games aren't guaranteed to go forward just yet. 
The chief of the organizing committee says they can't predict what will happen and discussions are ongoing. COVID cases are on the rise in Tokyo and several athletes have been ousted after testing positive for the virus. Major sponsors are also pulling out of the games. Toyota says top executives will no longer attend the opening ceremonies and the company is pulling their Olympic TV ads. Disaster for Poland's swim team. Six swimmers have been sent home due to an administrative error. Officials say the federation had entered 23 competitors, but were only allowed to enter 17. The athletes found out they were unable to compete when they arrived in Tokyo and were sent home heartbroken. It's unclear how the error occurred. One athlete says the group may sue Poland's swimming federation over the mistake. Today, Muslims across the world and here in the GTA are celebrating Eid al-Adha, the festival of sacrifice. It's the first celebration that actually feels like one since the pandemic began. And while some restrictions are still in place, families can still gather with loved ones to mark the special day. The day started with prayer. Hundreds of Muslims stood side by side wearing masks inside and outside of mosques like Islamic Foundation in Scarborough. Prayers were also held at the Islamic Institute of Toronto and Ontario Place, which hosted Eid Fest today. Food trucks, entertainment and outdoor activities for all after what felt like a very long time. Last year we were at home. We didn't pray together as a Muslim community together. Today we get a chance to pray together, which is very nice. Eid al-Adha marks the commemoration of Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son in obedience of God, as well as the end of the annual Hajj to Mecca. It's a very significant day for Muslims. This year is particularly significant given that it's been two years since we've been able to hold such a gathering due to the COVID-19 restrictions here in Ontario and also in the wake of the recent uh, terror and hate crimes uh, that Muslim communities have been facing here in Canada. What a pleasure to be with you here this morning, my friends. Eid Mubarak. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau acknowledged the difficult year Muslims have had at a Hamilton mosque today, condemning Islamophobia and saying every single Canadian needs to take action against it. People of faith are worried, is it safe to walk the streets in Canada? That is unacceptable, but it is the reality. We also must understand the impact today of the hatred that still exists in pockets of our society. Mayor John Tory took the opportunity to thank the Muslim community for all it has done. Countless Muslims across every part of our city have done their part, not only by getting vaccinated, but by working and volunteering in their communities to help others get vaccinated. This is just one example of hundreds that exemplify the sacrifices and the contributions made by our very own Muslims to safeguard their city. While it is a day to reflect, it's also one to have fun. Oakville resident Fatima Basit got a chance to host a party today. Cooking a feast is one of the many things she missed most these past few Eids. Eid is always about uh, celebration and with family and friends and food and everybody get together. And uh, we, you know, didn't get chance to celebrate that. So this time it's, you know, we are more excited. You know, I haven't seen the family and friends uh, very often. Muslim families we spoke to say Eid actually feels like Eid today, but they're still hoping for bigger and better celebrations next year, hopefully without any restrictions at all. For City News, I'm Aliha Sheikh. around the world attending morning prayers to mark Eid al-Adha. Hundreds of people showed up at the mosque on 96th Avenue in Surrey. For many, it was a huge relief to be able to gather today and pray along others, alongside others at the mosque. We all went through a very difficult time uh, during the COVID, and this is really good to be back almost in a normal situation. I, I'm saying it's not 100%, but at least I feel comfortable uh, coming here after such a long time because uh, we were extremely lost, uh, especially in last two Eids. Uh, we did not have this opportunity to pray together, but I'm really glad to see all the brothers and sisters you know, coming out, and they have attended. I'm very impressed, and I wish them a very, very happy Eid Mubarak. 
The holiday is also known as the Feast of Sacrifice, as goats are often the livestock sacrifice to help feed the needy.